Good morning. My name is Dave Hudson, and I begin the service in your tradition of ringing the bell. We will ring this bell three times. The first is to recognize that we all are beholden to relationships with those who occupied and prepared this land and this society before us. Many tribes once occupied the low country of South Carolina, including the town of Beaufort, where I live, among them the Yemisi and the Combahee. Here, the Ohlone tribes reigned. For our country as a whole, we must recognize the many laborers who toiled to hand us a prosperous economy, although many of them once experienced great exploitation. Many still do. The second calls us into relationships with ourselves and with one another and with the ethical voice of right relationship which guides us. May this voice prompt us to do right by one another, grow in wisdom and compassion and share it generously. The third bell calls us into relationship with our children and our children's children out to the seventh generation, helping us to realize that what we do now or what we fail to do will be felt by those who come after us. When you were very young, my mother explained to the people assembled at the dinner the night before my ordination, you wanted to be the boss. Turns out what she really meant was that I didn't like to work very much. I just wanted to be in charge. As a kid, she continued, you had an inkling for telling others what they should do. You didn't want to be the person who was told, especially when being told meant that you were the one doing the hard work. Working long hours was not your thing. Doing more work than others and getting less of the reward didn't appeal to you. And you seem particularly put out when neither your father nor I were ready to relinquish our parenting positions and put you in charge. So, she continued, some would say your becoming a minister was the fulfillment of a lifelong dream of being the boss, <laughs> of being in charge. Except, she went on, I saw that you were getting to the point you are today, came after giving up many more high pain many more much prestigious positions. You especially stumped your father, who would have been quite fine with you becoming a wealthy, successful boss. He could never really understand why you got so stuck on ministry, especially after it became clear to you that ministers, even though they let you talk a lot, aren't really the boss of anyone. Your dad wondered if Unitarian Universalism ruined you with all its talk about fairness, which you became obsessed with. Because you stopped believing in making the money and being the boss that you once did, and you started believing in fairness, asking what it meant to believe in people, what it meant to believe in the world that you lived in, and what it meant to earn a place alongside the people that you believed in most. And so it was that in that short address to my friends and colleagues, 
My mother summed up my entire call to ministry. Unitarian Universalism changed my course from wanting to promote a world where people have power over others to where people share power with others. I think Unitarian Universalism did ruin me, but it did so by blessing me and by repeatedly putting me in positions where it became abundantly clear I had power over no one. And the result was immersing me in a faith that relied on me aligning myself with those who stood for the fairness I believed in most. Today on this Labor Day weekend, we are going to be talking about labor and how committing ourselves to relationships where we hold power with can help us build a faith in what's around us. And we'll learn how clinging to systems of power over can keep us from ever encountering a faith in anything beyond ourselves. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. Welcome to Mission Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Deanna Alm, and I am this year's president of the Board of Trustees. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. We are excited to have alongside our minister, the Reverend Greg Ward, today's speaker, Dave Hudson, who you heard from at the beginning. Dave and his wife, Kate, were part of Reverend Greg's first congregation in Roswell, Georgia. Dave was a longtime worship associate and an enthusiastic participant, and eventually a teacher in Reverend Greg's sermon writing classes. Dave became a favorite speaker in that congregation as well as in many others in the Atlanta area. He and Kate recently retired and are here in the Bay Area visiting their three children who and are beginning to be introduced to the magic of being grandparents. Dave, we're really happy you could join us. Unitarian Universalism is a radically inclusive, non-doctrinal, non-dogmatic, open-minded and open-hearted faith. We are people who are all coming at truth from different paths. We gather together across different identities, experiences, and beliefs to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Together, we see our jobs to love the hate out of this world, heal the hurt in ourselves and one another, and to be the change we'd like to see. We use chat in our Zoom or our Joys and Concerns book, which is out by the door, in order to share joys and concerns, personal milestones of importance, which will be read aloud in the service. Maybe you're here with us for the first time. We've been reaching out and asking people to bring their friends because we think the world, especially now, needs some friendly places to gather and find encouragement and hope. We have social hour after the service where we get to visit with one another in breakout rooms or on the patio. For the folks attending via Zoom, the worship host will give you more information about how this works immediately after the service. In the meantime, we put a link to our weekly newsletter in the chat so you can see all the events we have coming up. We encourage you to join anything that speaks to you. We also put our welcome email, welcome at mpuuc.org, and you can email there in order to request a newsletter or other information be sent to you. There are a few things that I want to especially call your attention to. In-person attendees should be masked inside and outside of Cole Hall during the service. Because it is becoming apparent that vaccinated people can sadly still spread the disease to others, we strongly encourage those who are in contact with children or with unvaccinated or immunocompromised adults to attend services outside or via Zoom. We do allow worship associates, worship leaders, and other service participants to be unmasked while speaking if they disclose that they are vaccinated and are 10 feet apart from others. We do ask that you silence your electronic devices during the service. Uh, finally, a new announcement. We have supplies to create shiny new name tags, but we need information from you. The new name tags are gonna be on lanyards, so no more holes in your shirts pretty soon. And they also have a field where you can include the pronouns that you want people to use for you. This can be a very welcoming thing for newcomers to see. If you've not done so already, please use the link that is posted in Week on the Peak or click, click on the link that Kathy is putting in the chat now. 
Click on that, it should open up a new tab on your device, and then you can fill in the form right after the service. If you have questions or need assistance, again, please email welcome at mpuuc.org, and a member of our welcome committee will be happy to help you. If you see or hear something into this morning's service that inspires you, makes you laugh, brings you hope, please tweet it or share it on social media or just tell a friend. We are trying to start a wave of love and justice with every gathering. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Please join with me in reciting these words which calls us together as a community and with Unitarian Universalists all across the globe. We light this chalice to remind ourselves to treat all people kindly because we are all one family, to take good care of the earth because it is our home to live lives full of goodness and love, because that is how we will become the best people we can be.
This morning's story is called Greta and the Giants. It is inspired by Greta Thunberg's Stand to Save the World. It is by Zoe Tucker and Zoe Persico. There was once a girl who lived at the heart of a beautiful forest. Her name was Greta. One morning, things weren't quite as they should be. Greta stepped out into her yard, and there, huddled together in the shadows of the trees, were all the animals of the forest. A soft, silvery brown wolf stepped forward with his tail low to the ground. Please help us, he whispered. The forest is broken and we don't know where to go. The giants are ruining our home. The giants had always been there for as long as Greta could remember, but now they were worse than ever. There were huge, lumbering oafs, and they were always busy. They chopped down trees to build homes. Then they chopped down more trees and built bigger homes. The houses grew into towns and the towns grew into cities. They built factories and shops and cars and planes. They worked all day and all night until eventually there was hardly any forest left. But the greedy giants had forgotten how wonderful the forest was. They didn't see all the little birds and bugs and butterflies and bears that trembled in the shadows. And no one told them to stop because everyone was scared of them. Everyone, that is, except Greta. Will you help us? asked the wolf. Greta looked around her. The animals looked tired and sad. She had to help them, but how? Then Greta had an idea. The next morning, Greta went to the middle of the forest and waited for the giants to come. She stood alone, holding a big sign. The sign said, stop. She waited and waited. On the first day, the giants didn't see her and lumbered right on by. And on the second and third day too. But on the fourth day, something strange happened. A little boy who had been watching Greta made a sign as well and came out and sat down next to her. He didn't say much, but Greta knew he felt like she did. Soon, more people and animals saw what they were doing and joined in too. Before long, a huge crowd filled the forest, stretching out to the city and the roads beyond. They stood together and waited. The crowd was so huge that the giants were stopped right in their tracks. Please stop. Greta cried. Your greedy behavior is spoiling our home. You're, you have broken the trees and trampled the flowers. And now the bees and the birds have all flown away. These animals are homeless and our forest is dying. After Greta had spoken, 
everything was silent. But then everyone in the crowd began to shout. The smoke from your fires is choking the air. And so please stop cutting down the trees. You can help plant some new ones and mend my home. We need to take care of the forest and live together. Will you please try? They all said. The giants shuffled and fidgeted and they stomped their big feet on the ground. They were so embarrassed and a little sad. You see, the giants were so busy building, they didn't see what they were doing to the forest or to the animals who lived there. The giants felt terrible. We're sorry, they said, and they promised to try harder. So from that day on, the greedy giants weren't so greedy. They slowed down and learned to sit quietly. They stopped working all the time and instead took up new hobbies. They stopped chopping down trees and learned all about gardening and living in the forest. They cooked, repaired, tidied and shared and before long the forest became more beautiful than they could have ever imagined this is a story about greta thunberg and about something called climate change Today, we are going to be talking a little about, bit about the labor movement and how it also required people to notice greed and to notice about what was being overlooked and how to stand up and make a difference and how other people chose to stand with them. It doesn't always happen as quickly as this story describes, but together we can all make a difference in making the world beautiful and fair. And that is a story worth telling. We come together every Sunday and all throughout the week for more than ourselves. We come to support one another and the ministries that infuse worth and dignity into us, our neighbors, our friends, our children, our youth, our programs of learning and leadership, and our ministries in the larger world, including our efforts toward anti-racism and anti-oppression. Please make a contribution toward these worthy causes by mailing your check to Mission Peak UU Congregation at the address on the screen. You can also use the bill pay option in your online banking or drop a check into the Mission Peak mail slot or pay online with a credit or debit card. Thank you for supporting and sustaining the efforts of members, friends, and staff. Your contributions help make loving, learning, and leadership more possible. And now is the time where we have our ritual of generosity of heart. The things that allow us to find hope and meaning, especially when times are difficult, is the love and the support we show to one another 
and we feel from one another's presence. If you have a joy or a concern that by sharing with this caring community might bring encouragement or resilience, we uh, offer you this time to write it briefly now in the chat if you're online or to write it in the book uh, so that we can share it aloud with this community. If you would like to share a silent stone by placing a stone in our stone garden, uh, we invite you during the music that will follow to come up stage right and place your stone and then walk off stage left. We will be um, treated to the music of Shauna Pickett Gordon playing the African American spiritual we shall overcome. These 
are the joys and concerns that are alive in our hearts this morning. It is written in our book that it is a great joy to be together in Cole Hall, especially that me, when it means that we can welcome Sean back with Priya present. Uh, those of you who are online uh, will just be jealous for us who get Sean to ourselves. Let us join together in the spirit of these prayers. We open our hearts to those who experienced the destruction of Hurricane Ida, whether in New Orleans or New Jersey or in places in between, and especially those who are without power or food or medical care. We open our hearts for those uh, who are on the poverty line, who experience the highest price in extreme environmental emergencies brought on by excessive human consumption, destabilizing our weather systems. We open our hearts to those affected by COVID-19, whether directly by infection to one of the variants or from the vulnerability of exposing loved ones or young children in schools and those whose family members serve as teachers or health professionals. We pray for our leaders, especially those who are elected, that their commitment to the long-term good overrides their commitment to the short-term process of getting elected. And we pray for voters all across the country that we learn to see past the dog whistle prejudices of fear-based politics and usher in shared interests rather than self-interests. And we pray for the love and the support we each need to be the person the world is calling us to be. And one last stone for the hopes and hurts still too tender to escape our heart. May we, for the sake of love, keep our doors our minds, our hearts, and our arms open. Amen. Our reading this morning is an excerpt for, of Reverend Mary Foran's sermon, Faith and Doubt, the Practice of Knowing Without Knowing, delivered at the Live Oak Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Alameda on August 24, 2014. So let's talk about this word faith, she says. What is it? If it isn't a set dogma or list of beliefs that cannot be proved. UU minister Tom Owen Toll says, quote, faith is deeper than belief or doctrine. Faith is the energizing spirit that gives birth to our convictions. Faith is that confidence which allows, indeed implores us to keep on moving forward even when we see partially know incompletely and act imperfectly." End quote. The Latin word credo is often translated as I believe. Owen Toll says more, more accurately it believes, quote, I give my loyalty, my heart, my faithfulness to, end quote. Credo, faithfulness is about what grips my being what underlies and inspires the firm commitments we make in our lives. Unitarian Universalism invites, encourages, and urges us to take faith seriously throughout our lives, to claim and live our values, seeking ever more depth about what that means. Sharon Salzberg, the, the Buddhist teacher connected with the bringing of insight meditation to the West describes faith, quote, as an inner quality that unfolds as we learn to trust our own deepest experience, 
No matter what we encounter in life, it is faith that enables us to try again, to trust again, to love again. Faith links our present day experience, whether wonderful or terrible, to the underlying pulse of life itself." End quote. Thank you, Sharon, she says. I think of these two perspectives on faith as representing different aspects of faith. Owen Toll's energizing spirit being a blaze that fuels discernment and action, and Salzburg's trust in our own deepest knowing holds us up when we lose heart and beckons us back to the pulse of life itself when all seems dry and broken. In Pali, the language of the Buddha, the word for faith or confidence or trust is sada. Sada means to place the heart upon. Faith is offering, trusting, risking one's heart. In Hebrew, one meaning of the word denoting faith is willingness to take the next step. Faith is a verb. It's about beliefs, but it's about the beliefs we develop from our experiences that propel us into living our values. Faith is what we do. Here ends our reading.
Let me begin by saying that it is a real, genuine pleasure to be here with you today and with Greg, who 20 years ago um, opened a door for me and uh, that and ushered in a new, rich, rewarding, fulfilling phase of my life. So some of what I share to you, some of what I learned from Greg, whom I consider a mentor, um, I'll share with you today. Some have asked, what is the point of religion for those who don't believe in God? By which they usually mean a supernatural mover and shaker, bearded cloud sitter and scepter wielder. The question isn't one of belief. It's a question of being. It's a question of the nature of human existence, which is to be fundamentally connected to the whole of creation to be full participants in it, to be card-carrying, full-fledged members of its glory. We are stardust, as Joni Mitchell sang at Woodstock. Yes, we are, and stardust we will be again. We participate in religion and religious community because here we might get closer to that understanding, an understanding that Buddhists and others call enlightenment, and we participate in religion and religious community to experience the peace that accompanies that enlightenment or understanding, a peace that can be called grace. Grace because there's nothing we can do to create it. We can make ourselves accessible to it, let it into our lives, but it simply is the nature of existence in my humble opinion. Religion, at its best, when it is more than what Franciscan priest Richard Rohr calls our personal salvation project, religion, as at its best, addresses our fundamental existential angst, our core wounds of isolation, loneliness, separateness, and unworthiness. Regardless of how we experience and interpret the mystery, wonder, and power of life, regardless of our concept of the divine, wherever we are on the atheist-theist continuum, religion, at its best, provides us with a sense of, of worthiness and belonging. Here at Mission Peak, as in other churches of many stripes, you experience worthiness. You come to know, I trust, that regardless of your abilities and your histories, your heritage, your baggage, your IQ, your gender, your sexual orientation, your age, you are worthy. And here you experience belonging on a number of levels, the immediate level of daily interaction and belonging in community, and if you are paying attention, the more fundamental sense of belonging that can flow from that experience of worthiness, the sense of belonging to the whole of creation, of participating in the mystery and wonder of creation, in the miracle of simply walking on the earth, as Thich Nhat Hanh says. If there is a core wound in America today, it is that of a pervasive isolation, loneliness, separateness, and unworthiness. That wound is not unique to this country, but it may be stronger here than elsewhere because of our cult of individualism and the Horatio Alger myth of pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps, which have bred a hyper, laissez-faire, winner-take-all capitalism that pits us against each other, fosters a scarcity mindset that breeds fear and suspicion and impoverishes us all spiritually, if not economically. We have lost faith in each other's basic goodness because so often it is not apparent. We have lost faith in each other. We have lost faith in the power of cooperation and community. We have lost faith in the powerful notion raised by Martin Luther King 
the idea that I am not whole if you are not whole. The notion of the common good has fallen on hard times. To riff on a familiar UU hymn, sharing for many is not an answer. Not so for most Unitarian Universalists, I submit, for we understand on a visceral level, I believe, why we come together in religious community. The Latin root of the word religion, religare, means to bind together again, to make whole. We get that. America, on the other hand, in many ways, has come unbound. It was not always so in this country. In the early 20th century, exploited workers had enough faith in the strength de derived from binding together, uniting, to suffer brutality and risk and risk death at the hands of the state and heavy-handed bosses to do that, binding together and forming unions, faith. In an interview with Scott Simon on his weekend edition show a few years ago about a movie he had directed and starred in, The Three Burials of Melchiatus Estrada, Tommy Lee Jones told Simon that his was a journey film. The protagonist, he said, moves from a bad place to a good place, having learned something. And then he made a statement that lured Simon into trouble. He said, the movie has something to do with the consideration of the mechanics of faith. In what sense do you mean faith? Simon asked innocently. F-A-I-T-H, responded Jones. There was a long pause, awkward of course, after which Jones tried to pull his interviewer out of the quicksand by adding, Flannery O'Connor once said, faith is what you know to be true, even if you don't believe it. Faith is what you know to be true, even if you don't believe it. He went on, our movie looks at life from that perspective. What do you have faith in? And once you do have faith in something, what happens? On this Labor Day weekend, let me offer an example of that kind of faith. That of our oldest son, Ty. Ty, who as a child spent Sunday mornings in UURE classrooms, is now a union organizer and researcher in Oakland. In college, he became involved in an organization and movement called Students Against Sweatshops, which is dedicated, as the name implies, to convincing colleges and universities to buy clothing, hats, t-shirts, sweatshirts, from companies that do not employ sweatshop labor. Through that engagement, he became interested in other labor issues on his campus, and eventually, like a number of his friends, he became interested in the labor movement beyond his campus. When he graduated, he took a job as an administrative assistant in an office of the university so that he could become a member of the clerical workers union and from there work to further union causes on, on the campus. When his cover was blown, he was seen at a rally on the New Haven Green, his alma mater, Yale University, promptly fired him. In fact, they had suspected he'd been encouraging his coworkers to attend. He then went to work for the Service Employees Union, SEIU, in Stamford, Connecticut, organizing nursing home employees. And citizens understanding the value of the common good and contributing to it. And faith, says Coffin, is being grasped by the power of love. Recklessly, you leap and then you grow wings. It is not so much a leap of thought as of action. In matters of faith, it is first we must do, then we will know. Coffin goes on. First we will be, and then we will see. One must, in short, act wholeheartedly with absolute certainty, trusting 
without reservation, end quote. These are the mechanics of faith. This is Flannery O'Connor's acting on what we know to be true in our guts, whether or not we believe it, which is to say, without concern for the proof. Aware of profound truth called by it, of someday being involved in an organizing event. The, the lives, lives of the faithful. The lives of the faithful. There we are. Suggest that it is the power of their faith that fuels their actions, their good work. And further, I would submit that it is not possible to be so engaged in the relief of suffering, of bringing decency and dignity to people's lives, in Tom Owen Toll's words, without some kind of faith. This is what our son's life tells me and what my wife's life tells me. At a Moral Monday rally for Medicaid expansion a few years ago at the Georgia State Capitol in Atlanta with other UUs, all wearing their yellow t-shirts, she encountered the Reverend William Barber of Repairers of the Breach and the Poor People's Campaign, who came across to them and said, ah, I know those shirts. You are UUs. You are the love people. Indeed, we are the love people, because in Bill Coffin's words, as my father called him, we have been grasped by the power of love, our faith. And in Thich Nhat Hanh's words, we have naturally acted in a way that can relieve the suffering of people. We cannot change the world or our country individually, but acting together, we can help to move it toward justice. In Coffin's words again, we act buoyed by hope, despite the evidence, knowing that only by so doing can the evidence be changed. May it be so. I'll, I'll try to summarize. <laughs> uh, so my son wanted to be a union organizer. Um, it really didn't fit his skill set. He's now a, a, a researcher for the union in Oakland. Uh, but he, he took a job as an organizer with SEIU in, in Stanford, Connecticut. And after a couple of months, they let him go because he clearly wasn't a natural. They said, we don't have time to train you. So he looked around and he found a job in LA with the hotel and restaurant employees union um, for which he still works. After a few months there, he was frustrated at, at the organizing because again, he wasn't a natural. So he told the union that what he really wanted to do was um, was to be a part, to, to take a leave of absence from the union and uh, to join a, to, to take a job at a place where the union wanted to organize eventually someday, maybe, and um, be a part of an, of an organizing effort as a worker. So he did that. For four years, he worked at the Weston Hotel at LAX as a switchboard operator and, a, and at the front desk. Um, and as the union was preparing to go um, uh, live with the organizing effort, those who they had been, workers they had been working with um, privately, separately, um, so as you know, to, to keep them safe, met in the first organizing committee meeting and the people there uh, told their stories of why they wanted the union and how they were oppressed and what being organizing meant to them and, and uniting meant to them. And my son called us and said, that was an amazing meeting. I'm not as a religious person. Um, I don't know what the first, I've, I've never known what the word faith meant, but I have to say 
that that's the word that I would use to describe what was happening in that meeting. It was a religious moment. Um, it was powerful. And so then I went on to, to talk about um, what that, how that to me, uh, describes what I believe faith to be and what others like Thich Nhat Hanh and, um, and the Reverend Tom Owen Toll and the Reverend William Sloan Coffin um, believe. And that is that religion is ultimately about what you do with who you are. Uh, and that faith is ultimately having the courage and the conviction to act on what you believe to be true, even if that, that thing that you believe in can't be proved rationally. It's as, and I, I ended with some quotes uh, with, from the Reverend Bill Coffin, whom my father had the great privilege of spending some time with in St. Augustine, um, in 1964, before Selma, um, trying to integrate the public um, facilities there. Um, they shared a motel room for a week or so. Um, but Bill Coffin um, said that faith is, he says, first you will do, and then you will know. In other words, you take a leap not of, not of belief or thought, but of action. You say, I know that this is the right thing to do, even though I can't prove it, but, and prove that, it, that, that it's gonna be effective. Um, but that's the only way that we can move forward um, is just, just to, uh, to throw one's heart into what one believes, um, to act on it. And again, as Tom Owen Toll said, um, religion is ultimately about what we do with who we are. And so faith is a big piece of that. So I, I hope that helps. <laughs> so, thank you. Bind up the broken, we'll build a land where the captives go free, where the oil of gladness dissolves all morning. We'll build a promised land that can be. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, filled with the Spirit, may them create peace. For justice shall roll down like waters. Like an ever-flowing stream We'll build a land where we bring the good tidings To all the afflicted and all those who mourn And we'll give them garlands instead of ashes We'll build a land where peace is born Come build a land where sisters and brothers Filled with the Spirit, may them create peace, where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. We'll build a land where the forests are fertile, where the water and wind run clean and clear and commune. 
filled with the Spirit may then create peace. Where justice shall roll down like waters and peace like an ever flowing stream. One more time. Oh, come to the land where sisters and brothers filled with the Spirit. The summary of the sermon. Even if your audio goes out and you can't hear what is being said, the sermon was brilliant. <laughs> and it was about love and how love saves us all. Join with me in these words, which we use to re uh, extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. As we leave this sanctuary and go on about our lives, 
may we be filled both with Tom Owen Toll's energizing spirit that fuels our discernment and action and with Sharon Salzberg's trust in our own deepest knowing, a trust that holds us up when we lose heart and beckons us back to the pulse of life itself when all seems dry and broken. Go in peace, open to such faith.